Please welcome Developer Advocate from Google Timothy Jordan Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for such a warm welcome. That's very sweet. Uh, so today, I'm going to be talking about the new social web, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, and I, th I think it's about open standards. So we're going to look uh, at those and uh, why that is. Uh, but first off, a little bit about me. I'm a developer advocate at Google, and you can find me online. It's probably actually pretty easy to do so, but I've given you two hints. You can find my buzz stream at buzz.timothyjordan.com. And you can see me on Twitter. My uh, handle is Timothy Jordan. Also, if you happen to be using the buzzes or the Twitters, uh, feel free to use this hashtag during the session, uh, GDD2010JP. Um, that way we can all share in the fun later. All right, so what are we going to be looking at today? We're going to be looking at open standards. I'm going to go in depth with a cocktail of open standards that I think are really important for the social web. And I'm not alone. A lot of people are adopting these standards, and uh, they're quickly becoming very, very popular across the social web. And then I'm going to look at Google Buzz in particular. Now, I'm going to be talking about Google Buzz in relation to these standards throughout the talk. Uh, but then there's a special section where we'll look at how Google Buzz specifically uses a number of those open standards. And then I've got an example built on the Google Buzz platform that uh, we'll look at in some depth. And it's open source, so uh, the cool thing is, is we'll, go, we'll do a quick review and then you can go home and uh, download it and change it and upload a new one and just have a party. Sound like fun? All right. Let's start with open standards. I think that they're a really good thing. But let's take a step back and ask why. Why are open standards such a good thing? And we had to ask ourselves this at Google as we were building Google Buzz and as we were building the Google Buzz API. Because as you know, it sometimes seems like an easier path to roll your own proprietary standard for data encapsulation or protocol. It seems easier, and it seems like you can make a, a much more specific version for your product, that maybe there's no standard that really defines your product. So what is it about open standards that is valuable, that would make us want to use them instead of creating our own proprietary thing? Well, we asked ourselves this question, and we realized uh, initially that the value proposition for open standards was very similar to the value proposition for open source. Who here, uh, if you would raise your hands, is familiar with open source? OK, so most of us, yes? Uh, now, you may ask yourself, why is open source a good thing? I think um, by this point, open source has been around for long enough that many of us realize why it's important and why it's valuable. And there's two big reasons that pop out to me immediately. Um, and I'll talk about them in a moment, but just a brief intro, let's mention the word open. Let's remember that the word open in open standards and in open source uh, means that, well, at least in open source, that the original source code is freely available and can be re redistributed with or without modification. So it's, it's about um, opening up and uh, loosening restrictions, which is a good thing. Uh, and along those lines, that brings me to my first point, freedom. Open source is about freedom. It's the freedom to do what you want with your software. And that's really powerful, especially when we look back to before the, uh, the open source revolution, to when uh, proprietary software had a specific feature set, and we were locked into that. If we wanted to do something new or more interesting, we had to ask the company for it and wait. <laughs> and maybe we would get it. 
But with open source, we open up that source code and we add the feature ourselves, and there we are, right? The freedom to be able to do that. There was a, uh, a bumper sticker, I remember uh, way back when, it said, would you buy a car with the hood welded shut? And I think the answer is no, you wouldn't, because you couldn't change your oil, <laughs> you couldn't go in there and make modifications, y y you just, all of a sudden, it's not like you really owned that car. And it's the same thing is true for open source software. When it's open source, you can open up that hood and you can do whatever you want with the engine. The second important thing for open source is community. With open source, the product is not just controlled by one force, by one company or by one organization. It's controlled by everyone who wants to get involved. And that's really powerful because everyone's needs and views are respected. So that's open source, freedom and community. And we felt that open standards had the same benefits, the same freedom and the same community, plus a couple other things. First off, they allow you to simplify things. Open standards vast, vastly simplify the landscape for developers. This is because instead of learning three or four different formats or three or different, four different protocols for the, essentially the same thing, if everybody uses the open standard, you only need to learn one. Tangentially, there's interoperability. If there's one standard for the same sort of data, then my product and your product can speak the same language. Instead of translating into a different format so I can post to your product, or translating from your product's format into my language, I can just use the language that we both understand. And all of a sudden, our products get to work with each other and benefit from that relationship. So for these reasons, we felt, yes, open standards are important for our product. And that's one of the, and these are some of the many reasons that at Google we believe in using open standards wherever they exist, instead of rolling our own. All right, I'd like to talk specifically about a few open standards that I think are really important. The first one is OAuth. Who here has used OAuth? Excellent, that's wonderful. Well, I hope that this isn't too much of a review. I'm gonna go through the OAuth process to see what that looks like at a um, low level. And then of course later in the talk, I'll look at uh, using OAuth uh, with a client library, which vastly simplifies it. Um, we actually get a lot of questions at Google about OAuth, how to use OAuth in our particular products, so I think it's, it's important to cover. So uh, before I talk too much about this slide, uh, the reason OAuth is a good thing, um, and again, this is, is a bit review for most people here, so I won't spend long on it. Uh, the reason OAuth is good is, uh, well, there are many reasons. Um, first off, passwords are bad for the user, um, and giving passwords to other applications is even worse. If a user wants to be able to allow an application access to data on a specific service or product, giving the password to that application will give that application access to everything on that service and product. And that service and product needs to log in and like scrape data and it becomes very complicated. Whereas with OAuth, that application now has the ability to ask the user for API access to a specific subset of data on that service or product. And that user can then say, yes, I want application X to be able to access data types Y and Z. And no passwords are exchanged, 
your application. You don't have to keep the password for the user, which is really dangerous, and you don't have to get all complex with scraping data. So that's OAuth. Uh, and this is what OAuth looks like. Essentially, you have an application that gets an unauthorized request token from the service provider. You then use that unauthorized request token to send the user to the service provider for authorization. So the user arrives at a, at a Google web page and says, yes, give this application access to my Google Buzz stream. Then you get an authorized request token back from the service provider. That token becomes authorized and you can use that authorized token to get an access token. <laughs> and then you can use that access token to get data. All right, so to recap, you get an unauthorized token, you send the user to authenticate and authorize, you get an authorized token, which you exchange for an access token, and you use that access token to get data. That's OAuth. And it's nice because it covers a lot of really great uh, um, security edge cases and uh, allows your application to specify exactly what kind of data it wants. And at no time do you ever have to accept a password or store a password. That's OAuth. All right, next up is Atom. This is an obvious one. Who here has used Atom? I think there's more of you that's used Atom. <laughs> Who here has ever read a web feed, an RSS feed? Okay, keep your hands up. <laughs> Additionally, who's ever used Google Reader? Okay, everybody keep your hands up. Just, we're just adding hands. And who's ever, uh, I don't know, read a blog or blog? more of you that have read blogs. <laughs> All of you have come in contact with Adam. Okay, you can put the hands down. I do that because Adam is one of those unsung heroes of the web. Yeah, it's in a lot of places, but we don't really notice it very much. Essentially, it's XML. It's <gasps> extensible markup language, right? Um, so it looks a lot like HTML, but it has specific sorts of information with specific sorts of name tags. Now let's take a, a quick look at an Atom feed. All right, when you initially look at it, uh, much like the first time you looked at an HTML web page, it's a little intimidating. There's a lot of stuff up there. But it's actually really simple. If you take out a lot of the extra stuff you don't really need, right? We can simplify it a little bit. It looks like this. Right? And if you're scanning through here, I'm sure you can already sort of pick out certain elements. Let me highlight a few. So these are the required elements of an Atom feed. We've got an ID, an updated, and a title. The updated, of course, is just a timestamp of the last time this feed was updated. So these are the only required elements in an Atom feed. Pretty simple, right? And here are the recommended elements, author and link. And then these propagate down into the entries as well. You can sort of start to see the entry there. Also has an ID, an updated a title, and then an author. Um, the author, of course, is just the person who authored the feed. Um, and the entry is the author of any item. Uh, and then the link is the link to the feed on the blog. In this case, this is taken from the social web blog. So you can actually go to the social web blog, uh, which is a, a Google blog, and uh, pull off the feed and, and you know, pull out all the extra stuff and you'll get the exact same thing. So that's Adam. Adam is really good because it allows us to um, have a common format for data encapsulation for published or syndicated data which means something like Google Reader can actually exist. If you didn't have Atom, you didn't have a common format for all this stuff, 
then Google Reader would have to know a billion different languages to be able to read in data from the web. And that would be really difficult to do. All right, pub sub hubbub. Who here knows pub sub hubbub? So a few of you. I was actually uh, really surprised and encouraged to see so many hands raised at the uh, social web panel earlier today when they asked the audience, you know, who knows pub sub hubbub? Quite a few people raised their hands because um, in America it's still, you know, it's still pretty unknown, but there's, um, it's gaining popularity. Uh, I'm going to talk how, about how pub sub hubbub works, uh, but first let me tell you why it's important. Uh, it's important because as the social web becomes more disparate, as it spreads out to different properties, those properties need to exchange more and more data. And it would be great if that data arrived in real time. With pub sub hubbub, it can. Without pub sub hubbub, there's ways to make the data real time, but they don't work very well, and I'll talk about those. And with, with Google Buzz, we wanted PubSub Hubbub because we wanted to be able to publish a lot of the Buzz data to other products and be able to have them consume it in real time. So with PubSub Hubbub, essentially you have a publisher, a subscriber, and a hub. Hub, sub, hub. And then the bub is just for fun. Now, what it used to be is the subscriber would ask the publisher every time it wanted new data. So maybe you have a 30-second loop, and every 30 seconds, the subscriber says, hey, do you have updated data? And the publisher says, no, I don't. And then one time out of 10, it says, why, yes, I do. You can see how this is a really inefficient algorithm. Yeah? And you can imagine if you have a whole bunch of subscribers across the internet all hitting the same publisher, that publisher is going to get overloaded with unnecessary requests. All these people are asking, do you have new data? And it's just saying no a million times and then 10 times saying yes. That's not right. So we do something like pub sub hubbub. Essentially, it works like this. The subscriber will ask the publisher, hey, I'd sure like your feed. And the publisher that's pub sub hubbub enabled will return a feed with a hub link. And that hub link will essentially is an indication to the subscriber, you know what, I'm pub sub hubbub enabled, go use this hub. Right? And we'll say that here. The subscriber will then pull the hub. And it says, hey, I've been told you're the hub for this feed. I would sure like to subscribe. And in that request, it'll contain a URL that that hub can call back. So it tells the, the, the hub, use this URL every time there's an update. The hub will first verify, right? Because we wouldn't want to give everyone the opportunity to send denial of service uh, attacks. Yeah, if there's a hub that has a lot of data and you subscribe somebody else to it and it's pushing all this data to another server that can't handle the load, that would be bad. So what the hub will first do is call that call back and ask the subscriber, are you sure you wanted to subscribe to this? Subscriber will return, yep, that was me. And then it will be subscribed to the hub. Now the hub will get the data from the publisher in one of two ways. The cool way that not all publishers can do yet, but increasingly so over time, is that the publisher will say to the hub, I have new content for you. The hub will then say, well, give me that content, please. And the publisher will send that content back. That's the cool way, because the publisher is sending the hub something every time there's new data. The other way, which is okay too, is that the hub will ask the publisher, give me your latest um, content. And the publisher will give it to them. Now, even in this second scenario, it's better than all the subscribers asking the publisher. Because now we just have one entity asking the publisher instead of a million. The hub, when it gets new data, 
we'll send that, we'll, we'll say to the subscriber, here's the new data. It sends essentially what we call a fat ping. Yeah? It's a post request on the callback URL to the subscriber, which is like submitting a form, right? Um, that contains the updated data. And the hub can do that to one subscriber or to a whole bunch of subscribers, right? And this is where PubSub Hub Hub gets cool. You've got a million subscribers. The publisher only has to tell the hub. And all the hub does is get new data from the publisher and send it to all those subscribers. So what you can see is that we've really simplified our landscape here. And we've, we've, we've segmented the activities among different servers which is really nice, and we've significantly reduced the number of requests that need to happen on the internet, and we have real-time updates. So that's pretty cool. Now, this is PubSub Hubbub as most of us would use it today if we were to build a uh, PubSub Hubbub enabled app. This is also a possibility. I love this diagram, I, I didn't make it, but it's staggering. Um, and it would work. <laughs> Something like this without PubSub Hubbub would have been vastly more complicated. So that's PubSub Hubbub, and we think it's really important. Okay, now here's another protocol that we don't have enabled on Google Buzz yet, but uh, we're planning on it and we're working hard on it. Uh, we think it's really cool and it's gonna do great things for the social web distributed especially. Essentially, Salmon is a protocol that allows uh, cross-site syndication of comments. Who's used or knows of Salmon? There is one of you in the audience. Thank you. <laughs> um, it is uncommon, but I, I think it's really important, so I'm, I'm glad to be able to talk about it today. Salmon is really, really simple. Essentially, a source will have uh, an entry, let's say a blog post, and it'll send it out to a subscribed or parallel aggregator via something like PubSubHubUp. That aggregator will then also show that entry. An example of this would be like say multiple blogs that share the same post. Now wouldn't it be cool if comments on that aggregated blog would show up on the source blog? What PubSub Hubbub does is essentially says, okay, source goes to the aggregator, the aggregator republishes that entry, and when a new comment shows up on the aggregator, it sends it back via Salmon to the source, essentially just sending the data back in the salmon format. That source says, okay, I'll publish it on the thread. Before it does this, it verifies provenance. Just make sure that that comment originated on that aggregator instead of an aggregator um, being bad and trying to publish a comment. Um, from another aggregator. So the source republishes it on itself and then it sends it out to all the aggregators. And all the aggregators says, say, thanks, we'll republish that right away. And the reason we call it uh, salmon is because those, uh, the entries go downstream to the aggregators and then the comments swim upstream to the source. Salmon, get it? So I have this diagram just, just in another fashion. Um, this shows it here, the aggregator gets a comment, sends it to the source, the source says, oh, you have a new comment, cool, and publishes it to all the aggregators. So you can look at it this way too, which I think is easier to see. Anyway, that's Salmon, all right. I've saved one of my favorites for last. This is Activity Streams. Uh, who has heard of Activity Streams? Okay, just a few of you. This is one of the most important protocols. Activity Streams 
are an encapsulation for user activity on the social web. So we have something like a Atom, right? And Atom's cool, and it, and it does blogs really well, right? Like syndicatable content. Uh, it doesn't do something like sharing a link or posting a note. Like a user activity, something that you would perform on a social website. So activity streams is essentially an extension to the Atom format, adding three essential items to it to indicate that activity. And it's important because users' social activities on one site are important not just to that site, but to any website that that user touches. Because as we know, increasingly, users want to spend time being social wherever they are. They don't want to have to visit one website and then go to another website to share that link or to talk about it. They want to be able to be social anywhere they are on the web because that's how we are in real life. Why should it be any different online? With having something like activity streams, we can encapsulate that activity and share it or syndicate it out anywhere. That's why it's important. So first off, we need an actor. Right? This is the identity of the user. Second, we need a verb. This is the activity that they're performing. And third, we need an object. This is um, what they're performing the activity on or with. An example is this. Timothy posts a note. In this case, the actor is me, Timothy. Posts is the verb, and a note is the object. It's the thing that I'm posting. Another example could be following. Like Barack Obama started following Timothy Jordan which I'm waiting to happen any day now. Admittedly, it'll probably look more like this for some time. Timothy Jordan started following Barack Obama. And it doesn't just have to be started following or posts a note, right? Uh, it could be new stuff. We can extend these verbs to be whatever we want. For example, uh, Timothy has tea with Bella Swan, you know, from the Twilight movies. which might be something that I would do. So these are activity streams. And you can see why this is important, right? And it's really simple. It's not that hard to make an, an existing Atom feed an activity stream feed. Because if you have a social application, you already have the actor and the verb and the object. You just need to designate them as such with the activity stream markup. So these open standards are the foundation of this new social web. We have authentication. We have data encapsulation. We have real-time syndication. We have cross-property syndication. And we have user activity encapsulation. With this, we can connect social websites like never before. And each of these open standards uh, benefit from the value proposition I outlined at the beginning, freedom. Right? They're, you're free to use these as you want in whatever product. Uh, community. Right? These are all community-oriented protocols. Uh, simplify. Yeah, by learning just these open standards, all of a sudden you don't, uh, you don't have to learn a whole bunch of new things um, to be able to do just user, uh, like activity streams. You can just use the activity streams you already know. And then finally, interoperability. Your applications can talk to other applications because you all use the same open standards. All right, let's take a look at this in the Google Buzz API. I think it, it it's, um, behooves us to have sort of a real world look at what this is like. Wow, it's really red in here now. Okay, I really like this. It's, it's mood lighting. 
Okay, first off, a warning. As evidenced by our adorable laboratory professor here, uh, the Google Buzz API is in labs. Now, what that means is uh, you can still write an application that's stable, yeah, and you can expect the API to be stable, uh, but you wouldn't want to write an application and forget about it for a few months. You want to stay current with the API so that as we come out with new features and improvements, you can incorporate those into your application. And the Google Buzz API is based on all of these standards. Uh, as mentioned before, Salmon uh, is, is sort of a future promise, but the rest we're already using today. So first, let's talk about activity streams and Atom. Now I'm going to show you a feed in JSON, but it could just as well be in XML, in which case it would be Atom. Um, and what you'll notice in JSON, we're actually using many of the same uh, key value pairs as we would use in Atom. It just happens to be in the JavaScript object notation. All right, so activity streams, remember, actor, verb, object. Timothy posts a note. So this is what it looks like in the stream. Now, um, I've done a couple things to simplify this for the screen. Uh, I've The light green uh, curly brace variables, uh, there's actually data in there, but it was too long to put up on the projector. Um, and I've faded out in gray the stuff that I'm not talking about. And I've just highlighted what I want to mention. In this case, this is the actor. Right? So this is the identity of the user. And that needs an ID, right? a globally unique identifier for that user. Um, and needs the name, in this case, it's me. Um, it needs a profile URL and a, th and a thumbnail. The, uh, in this case, the, the ID for the Google Buzz feed is actually a numeric ID, big long number. The profile URL is a fully qualified URL, so you can copy and paste that into a browser and get my profile. Same thing with the thumbnail. You get an image right back. Second thing, verbs. In this case, post. It happens to be the only verb in uh, Google Buzz right now. There's a whole bunch of verbs in activity streams, but there's only one that we use. And it's really simple, just an array, one item. And then finally, object. The object has a type and it has a content. In this case, it's a note. And when you post something on Google Buzz, it's always a note, and you're always posting. And then in the content, in that, uh, those quotes, is the actual content of the buzz. And here we just have three words. It's sort of silly, but uh, we actually did a test, and um, one of our partners pasted in Hamlet. And it actually posted through the API, so that was pretty fun. Okay, so up here we've got uh, the things that we would expect from an Atom feed. We've got a title, we've got a published. Um, it's not required, but it's nice to have. It's the original date that this was published, the updated, and we've got an ID. And then we have extra things, right? Because there's more to the social life than just I, uh, actor, verb, object, right? We also have liked. And you can see here under um, links, uh, we've got uh, a URL to get the feed for the likes, and we've also got a count. Those are the two most important things, right? And we can also do replies in the same way. We've got a number of replies under count, and we've got a URL to get the replies feed. And then f uh, we also have a source. As you can see, when you're looking on Google Buzz, it'll say, what was this posted from? Maybe it was posted you know, from Buzz, or maybe it was posted from uh, an application. We have applications such as, say, Seismic and TweetDeck. And those applications a user can use to, to read their Buzz stream and post to Buzz. And when they do so, it will show up in Buzz or in any other application that it was posted from one of them. Either TweetDeck or Seismic would be here. We also thought it was really important with Google Buzz that we have per post privacy set settings. And that's here under visibility. Essentially, this, is gonna sh this shows public, um, but it could have private and a specific group that that's private to, say, coworkers. And we also thought it would be nice to have geocoded data. So we actually have here a latitude and longitude, which is pretty cool, an address 
which makes more sense, and a place name, which actually makes sense to the user, right? Um, with using the Google uh, Places API, you can indicate here uh, where the user was. Instead of just a latitude and longitude on Earth, it could be Joe's Coffee Shop, which is a lot more interesting to users. We can also encapsulate uh, links. It looks like this. And in the JSON, it looks like this. So you can see there's an attachment, uh, and it includes a link and a title, as you would expect. Uh, you can include an image. It looks something like this. And the JSON actually looks like this. It's, again, under attachments, under the object. And this time, it's a type of photo, as a preview, and then the actual image. So you can see this activity streams thing is really powerful. We can even include a video. Yeah, There's all sorts of things we can include. There's all sorts of verbs that are available for activity streams. Uh, with, by using this open standard, there's pretty much uh, nothing that a user does um, socially on the website that you can't now or soon be able to encapsulate and share with the world. Uh, Google Buzz just uses a subset of these. But any product could use more and more over time. All right, next up is OAuth. Now, with OAuth, you have all these variables. You have an auth URL, a scope, a domain. Um, of course, you translate that into a URL. Hopefully, you have a client library to do this for you. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a moment. But this URL will send the user to uh, this authorization screen. In Google Buzz, we have this. And it's really clear to the user by reading this screen and the next screen what exactly this application will be able to do with their Google Buzz data. Yeah? There's two scopes available. There's a read-only and a full access scope. With read-only, the application will be able to read all your data but won't be able to post anything, which is really great if maybe you have one of those social um, games and you just want to be absolutely positive that it's not going to post advertisements to your account. Um, but uh, uh, the full access scope is, is the more commonly used scope. That's OAuth. All right, so PubSub Hubbub. We're using PubSub Hubbub for our firehose, we give away a PubSub Hubbub enabled field, uh, sorry, uh, feed of every Google Buzz public post, which is actually really cool. Yeah? Um, it's a lot of data, so if you wanted to play around with uh, the firehose but you didn't want to overload your server resources, we also have a garden hose available. And this is designed to come under the free quota limits for App Engine. So you could build a reasonable App Engine application um, on the, the, the garden hose. And you just subscribe to it like you would any other feed, uh, PubSub Hubbub feed. All right. And then Salmon. We don't have it implemented yet, but we have future plans for it. Uh, we think it's really important. So those are all those protocols. Now, I want to take you through a quick example. Um, and I'm going to go through this pretty quick because I don't, uh, there's some slides here that um, are slightly orthogonal, so I think I'm going to skip over them because we're running low on time. But I will tell you what the application is, and we'll take a look at the OAuth flow because I think that's really interesting. Um, the, we built this application for Google I.O. last year, and it's essentially buzzword bingo, which is a form of bingo, if you've played it, uh, at conferences where you get a, a bingo board with keywords. And then you listen to someone like me rattle on for 45 minutes about some cool new technology. And every time I say one of those keywords, you mark it off on your board. You get five in a row. You scream bingo in the middle of the session. And we all have a good laugh. We built it on Google Buzz. So essentially, what the user does is sign in the application. The application generates a bingo board. The user then goes out and joins conversations on Google Buzz with keywords from their board, yeah? joins conversations around those topics. The game will then mark off their board every time it finds a keyword in one of those conversations, and eventually they get five in a row and they get bingo. So that's how the game is played, and you can go out and you can play it. I'll show the URL again. Um, and. Uh, but I, I just want to talk about uh, a few aspects of it. So uh, first off, what it looks like 
is the user interacts with Buzz Bingo, our, it's an app engine application, and the user interacts with Google Buzz. The Buzz Bingo application interacts via the Buzz API with Buzz directly as well. So you can see the user is still using Google Buzz and they're using the application. So first off, the user signs in and authorizes the application for use of Google Buzz. When they land on the application homepage, it looks like this. They click sign in and it takes them to that auth screen. Um, if they're not already logged in, they'll need to log in through the Google login screen. And then here's the code. So remember that sort of complicated flow with OAuth? Well, the nice thing is that now we have client libraries across a lot of products, including Google Buzz. And there's a Python client library that's open source and free and available for you to use. Um, and the URL's at the end of these slides. Uh, you can go on, you can download this client library, and you can actually go in one of the examples, copy and paste some of this code, put in your own consumer key in secret, and have an authorized application. It's really simple and easy to use. And even if you didn't copy and paste, it's really straightforward. Essentially, you build uh, an OAuth consumer and a full access scope. You uh, get a request token and send the user out to that authorization URL that's also built from the library. Uh, the user gets sent to these auth screens and says, OK, continue, grant access. And then you store the request token and you exchange it for an access token. And then you can just use the library to access the data. That's how it works. All right, I'm going to sort of go quickly through some of these other slides. Um, this presentation will be available, so if you're really interested in some of the other code, uh, you'll be able to look at this, um, and I'll tell you where to get that. Uh, it, board is generated, user joins conversations, and marks the board as one would expect. And at the end, user gets bingo, and it does a post. So uh, the URL for the code is here. And there's also a working version of the application on App Engine. All right, I want to talk about uh, one more thing, and that's track. I mentioned the fire hose, and I mentioned the garden hose. Track is uh, similar. It's essentially a filtered version of the fire hose. So let's say you wanted to get every public buzz about a particular topic. Maybe you have a brand. Yeah, and you want to know when people are talking publicly about that brand on Google Buzz so you can join the conversation and in, uh, in, uh, improve opinion on your brand. Uh, yeah, maybe somebody didn't like um, your particular airline service on one day. You can join that conversation and apologize and give them a voucher. I don't know. Um, or maybe you just really like coffee and you want to know what people are saying about coffee around the world. Well, you can use our track uh, endpoint. And essentially, you give it a query and it'll give you real-time pub sub hub up updates every time anyone anywhere in the world posts about that topic. And you can actually also limit it via um, geolocation. And let me uh, bring up an example of this. Um, Google Reader. We're all familiar with Google Reader, right? Here is my, one of my personal Google Readers. You can, uh, this is actually not commonly known, but Google Reader is pub sub hub enabled. You can give it any pub sub hub feed and it'll receive updates in real time. In this case, I'm going to give it this feed, which is a track um, uh, URL. So we've got the, the, the URL prefix for the Google Buzz API, slash activities, slash track, and then we have a query. In this case, it's coffee or tea. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to subscribe to it. Just click Add here. And you can see I immediately have data, which is really super cool. And actually, if you were to post right now about coffee or tea, it would show up immediately, which is pretty neat as well. So I encourage you to play with that on your own. Uh, with Google Reader. It's really, it's really a lot of fun to uh, just come up with interesting queries and see what time of day people are talking about things. 
uh, or you know, a query for all of Japan just to see what people are saying on Google Buzz in Japan. You know, and that, that's uh, really fun to do. So that's track. And you can see how we've used these uh, open standards in the API. And every time we've added a new feature, we've, we've asked ourselves, what open standards make sense here? And how can we leverage them best for our users and our developer community? And I think that's what it's all about, is how do we improve the landscape for everybody? And by using open standards, you can do that. So just a few extras. Um, again, this is my contact information, buzz.timothyjordan.com or at Timothy Jordan on Twitter. And my office hours are uh, outside um, by the cool API sign. I'm going to be there at 1600. So if you want to come hang out and talk about this uh, a little bit more, I'm more than happy to talk about this till the end of time because I really enjoy this work. And here's a whole bunch of URLs. Um, like I said, uh, I think these slides are available on the GDD website, but I will also post a buzz on my personal buzz uh, telling you where you can get them on um, one of my slide share places. With that, I hope you've enjoyed the talk, and I hope that we can talk about all of this more together as uh, we move forward with the social web. Thank you.